Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, it's always an honor for us to come before you uh, on a day, such a day as this, O oh Lord God, in a season. It's a season of prayer. It's a season of fasting. And so, Father, we present ourselves before you in this altar tonight, in this sanctuary. We ask, Lord, that you come down among your people, dwell amongst us. We pray for an anointing on this word that is going to be shared, the lips that are going to speak it, the ears that will hear it, as well as the hearts that will receive it. Take your place and have your way in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. My name has been said, David Sepuya. I'm not new here. Um, I just want to thank the provost, the vicar, and the entire pastoral team in this, uh, um, of this congregation for the privilege you give us to share the word. It's always an honor. And I want to thank you, um, all saints people. What do you call yourselves? All saints, sirs? What are you? Huh? Oh, the saints. Hallelujah. All you saints, all ye saints, let me use old English with you. Amen. I come from St. Francis Chapel. Um, my family is here, or part of my family. I don't know. Okay, they are, they are there. My wife, Julia, the Caleb, and Jason. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, um, I've been asked to share something to encourage us in this season of uh, prayer and fasting. Consecrate a fast and return. Consecrate a fast and return. I've modified it a bit. I've added on in a parenthesis that engage a jeer. So I, I believe you'll understand why. Now our, um, the text is Joel, from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 to 15. Let me read it quickly. Joel 2, 12 to 15, a call to repentance. This is what it says. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Turn with me, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And then Joel continu continues. So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and, great of, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, Joel was concerned about the approaching plague and a severe drought that was coming to the nation of Judah at that point in time. And so the prophet, the prophet um, listens to God. That is one of the uh, characteristics of prophets. It's actually the main one. To hear God and then to uh, bring forth what God has said. If any prophet, let me just warn you, brethren, that if there is anyone who claims to be a prophet, and one, you know them that by their lifestyle, they do not listen to God, but most of all, if what they say does not reflect what God is saying, then that's a false prophet. If what they so-called prophecy does not or is not reflected in scripture, that's a false prophet. That's a warning. That's one way of knowing who a true prophet is and who a false prophet is. So Joel listened to God and that is how he was able, one, to pick up what God was saying, but secondly, to build on it. So in, the, in, in verse 12, it is what the Lord is saying. 
in verse 13 to 15 and onwards through the rest of this chapter and indeed through the rest of the, this book, he is interpreting, he has, he's being driven by the Holy Spirit to understand what it is that needs to be done. And so, he's calling for a fast, consecrate a fast. Now, even though God had already made a judgment, um, slide number three, um, it was not too late for, for us to get mercy. It was not too late for the people of Judah to get mercy. Now, what it needed was a genuine repentance, inward repentance. And this is always an opportunity for us when we go into a fast to repent deeply. Indeed, do not go into a fast without repenting. That is the foundational point for a fast, to repent inwardly, not just, you, you see, it says here, surround your heart, not your garments. <clears throat> the ancient people, as a way of showing their, um, um, their um, remorse, would rend their clothing. Now, I'm not going to rent my clothing because if I did, then you'd see my nakedness. But no, we, it was a sign. However, that was only but an outward sign. They would cover themselves. You rent the clothes, then you put on a sack. You rent your clothes, then you paint yourself with ash. Hallelujah. I think it is a good sign. However, that is only but an outward sign. What we need to do is the inward, that is much more important. The inward. Because that's, it's your heart. Remember, um, God tells us, the Lord God tells us um, when they are choosing a king for Israel, that he does not look uh, on the outward. He goes for the inward alone. He sees the heart. So the heart is the critical thing. So, those of us who are in this fast for the sake of it, because everybody, because the entire church is fasting and it is not in your heart, please don't starve yourself. Hallelujah. Because if you are not clean inside, if you've not repented, if, 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 if it's not in the depth of you, you are simply on a hunger strike. Just go and have your meals. Till... It has entered you fully. Hallelujah. Amen. And so Joel calls us to repentance. He says, return. He says, call a sacred assembly. Blow the trumpet. Slide number four. Blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet. The trumpet call, the trumpet was used by the ancient Israelites as um, um, to, to summon people, to call people. But much more importantly than even the Israelites is the fact that the trumpet sound, it's something, it is a divine sound. We all know from, um, that the trumpet, sound will, will, the trumpet will sound in the last days. We read that in Revelation. We, we read it all the time when we are at funeral services. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The trumpet sound shall come. Jesus himself will be um, at, at his return. He will be accompanied or he will be preceded by a trumpet sound. So the trumpet is a very critical item uh, for, for, for calling forth God's people. And the wonder about this, this uh, the first that these people were calling is that no one was excluded. Not the children not the recently married. They are all to be a part of it. I know you've been marrying people here. Are they here or on honeymoon? You give them space to go to the honeymoon. But when they come back, Provost, please call them. Let them join. They can join on the 23rd day. No problem. Why? We shall shortly be seeing the, the strength of a, the power of a corporate fast. Um, when I was preparing this message, uh, the conviction that the Holy Spirit put on my heart is that let's look at fasting in the, in the width or the breadth 
of spiritual discipline. So let's go to slide number six. We shall look at that. Now, fasting is a spiritual discipline. What are spiritual disciplines? These are practices in scripture that promote our growth as believers. That is a spiritual discipline. They are many. I'm just going to mention 12 of them very briefly before we get into uh, some depth with uh, fasting. But they are all in scripture. Any spiritual discipline that you need to follow has to be in scripture. Anything beyond uh, scripture, please take care. I know of um, Christians who have partaken of um, some of the practices of these other religions. Those, those things are very dangerous. Even some, I know this might sound controversial, but let me say it because I've been called to preach. Even some of the things that are done by Rotary and some of these other bodies, but mostly the, the, the Eastern religions. There are things there that may sound good to the human mind, but they are not of God. They've not been, you've not been, they, they, they've not been ordained of God. So they may bring discipline to your life. They may bring, but they are not spiritual discipline, disciplines of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they must be, in scripture, they, 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 that's where we pick them from. Now, we know that athletes must train to win. There is no athlete who wins without training. You cannot spend uh, six months eating gorillas. Anyone here eat gorillas? I, I do so once in a while when my sons, but they stopped eating them. Praise God. So you cannot spend six months eating gorillas and you think you are going to play well in uh, whichever, football, netball, whatever. And so you must train very well. If we go back to the previous slide, that person there, sorry, before, the, so, so uh, in as much as Christi, um, athletes train, so do Christians strengthen ourselves through spiritual disciplines. The, the person we have on screen there um, is a, she's an American um, athlete. She's called Alison Felix. She's a believer in Christ. She has a wonderful testimony. You can go back and um, <coughs> Google her name. Alison, Alison with A-L-Y-S-O-N, Felix. And so she, she's got a fantastic testimony and God has actually made her so, you know, he has really built her thing. I think she, she, she holds the record for the greatest number of medals won in, um, in the Olympic Games and, the, um, and World Championships, something like that, in athletics. She is, um, and she's also a fantastic mother. She is a family woman. But she is a disciplined person. If you listen to her life, whether in sports or in her Christian work, she is, she understands this thing. She has trained herself very well. Now, the uh, Apostle Paul coached his young son, Timothy. This is what he says um, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, that train yourself for godliness. <clears throat> For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now this verse or this portion of scripture, 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, is the cornerstone for spiritual disciplines. If you want to understand if you are studying, if you are doing a study on spiritual disciplines, begin with this verse because it is picked out of the, uh, the daily um, of sports training as we know it. And then um, Paul, Paul um, uses it in reference to, to the young man he was discipling. Let's look at 12 spiritual disciplines before we get in depth with fasting. Um, the first one that um, I picked up is solitude. What is solitude? It is refraining from interacting with other people to be alone with God. That is a discipline that we have lost in this 
not just a generation. I, I, I would say the church in, uh, today, we don't do much of solitude, and yet it's such a powerful thing. Jesus used to retreat. He used to go away in solitude. The whole thing of monks, and I'm not calling you to become monks, but monks picked a lot of their spiritual power through solitude. It is a, is a powerful thing. I have backslidden a bit on it. I haven't gone away for a bit of time. But the last time I did, which is about some years ago, um, I spent about, I think it was a week, a week away from everyone, from my family and all, and powerful things came out of it. I got a big commission and so, and so on and so forth. The Lord spoke to me. I, it just changed my life. So solitude is something we need to pick up as a spiritual discipline. Silence. Silence is not the same as solitude. Silence is not speaking in a quiet place in order to quiet your mind to attend to God's presence. Uh, number three is fasting. We shall get into that. The fourth one is rest or Sabbath. Rest. Doing no work to rest in God's person and provision. Um, the last week, I, I was at a conference, Africa-Israel conference, uh, prophetic conference. It was in Ginger. Uh, we had some people there from abroad and so on uh, who included some Jews. Now, one of the things I followed, uh, I've obviously the Bible, but also the life of, of Jews. It's, they have such a discipline, and one of the key things they have is rest. They understand the Sabbath much more than we do. And it's something that rejuvenates. It's not a Jewish thing. Many people call it a Jewish thing. It is God's thing. He says it right in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and throughout the rest of scripture. But anyway, rest is, is a great uh, spiritual discipline. Secrecy, not making um, our, our, goods, our good deeds and qualities known uh, to others so that God gets all the glory. Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus is preaching that sermon on the mount, he talks about charitable, our charitable um, uh, deeds that don't let people, you don't have to, to paint on this wall that this, was, this wall was painted by the Sepuya family. You know, no, 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 no. Let the glory go to God. I think my family have heard, but they know it anyway. Submission. Submission is a spiritual discipline, not asserting ourselves in order to come under the authority, wisdom, and power of Jesus Christ as our Lord, our King, and our Master. This can be difficult for African men. African men who are here say hallelujah. Ah, did the man next to you say hallelujah? <laughs> It can be difficult for African men. I am an African man. I know how difficult it is. But however, an African man who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you should be able to submit. Bible study is a spiritual discipline. Worship is a spiritual discipline. Prayer is a spiritual discipline. Now that one goes very well hand in hand with fasting. Then personal reflection and service. Those are good spiritual disciplines. When I was preparing this message, um, first of all, I, I got that leading to use, to, rather to contextualize around spiritual disciplines. <clears throat> and when I started researching them, reading them, then I was prompted further to use a, a symbol that all of us are familiar with to help us to understand what these spiritual disciplines are. And that symbol is a motor vehicle. Um, let's look at this. I don't know how legible this is, but this is the breakdown that I got. Now, before I get into the breakdown, a vehicle is a, is a, is a very interesting symbol for us believers because it is used of the Lord to speak to us as um, what they call prophetic symbols you know, something that makes sense. What does it represent? A motor vehicle represents life, you know, the movement of life. It also represents ministry um, for those who are called to minister. And this was the general breakdown that I got, that um, 
in the vehicle of life, the ignition, now first of all, for you to, to drive, for any of us to drive, you must have a driving permit. Hallelujah. So if you don't have a driving permit, uh, repent right now. But what qualifies us to drive in the, in, the, in the drive of life is salvation. So salvation becomes the driving, is the driving permit, salvation. Then the ignition, the ignition is, um, rather, sorry, then you have a driver. In life, you must have a driver, and I'll be sharing a, a, a testimony on that. Who is the driver of our lives? It is Jesus. Amen? Then the steering wheel, that's the Holy Spirit. Because your life had better be steered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? The steering wheel is the Holy Spirit. Um, when we are on the road, we must be disciplined. You don't want people driving anyhow. A few weeks ago, I was in industrial area with my wife and someone knocked us. Bang! You know, in the potholes of the industrial area. Bang! We just had bang. We drove on the side and then who comes behind us? The person who had knocked us came. It was a soldier. One of these ones with red this. Eh? Red that. So I wasn't going to argue much. So the man was saying, oh, what happened? Oh, no, no. He was now trying to put the blame on me. By the way, if you knock someone from behind, the blame is yours. And then he talked to his colleague. Now, interestingly enough, our, our um, boot was um, dented, but his car was much more damaged. Actually, his door couldn't even open. The bonnet went in and all. And then his friend came out, opened for him. They came out, did the converse a bit. And then suddenly I see them enter their car. I was wondering, now what's going on? And they begin to reverse. Now, guess what? I had to warn them. Why? Because as they begin to reverse, another car is reversing out of, we, we had stopped on the pavement. Another car, so they were going to bang this other car. So I tell the guy, stop, 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 stop. And he stopped. The other car went, and then he drove off. I saved him from another accident. But I wasn't going to make any arguments with these fellas. We've had people being shot for, for, for you know. Anyway, what's the point I'm making? Road discipline. That is case titty. Case titty is a, being cased, is being disciplined with your body. Don't engage in, um, in immoral activity. So that is road discipline. Then engine oil. Engine oil, the inspiration I got was confession. Confess, we must confess. Confession is a spiritual discipline. You must, you know, every now and then, you must change the engine oil. It must come out. Hallelujah. The engine oil must come out. You cannot be driving a car that you bought in 20, 2008 on the same engine oil. It has to come out periodically. So confession is a good discipline for us um, as we move in life. Seat belt. Seat belt is a sign of orderliness. You know, the first thing that police do when they stop you is to see whether you are, we we you are wearing a seat belt. The inspiration I got is that that is equivalent to worship. Worship is a discipline that we must do all the time. Then fellowship, fairing, sharing fellowship is also a good uh, spiritual discipline. You cannot live your spiritual life alone. You must have fellowship. And what I got in my spirit was that it's the passengers in your car. When a car is parked, of course, it is at rest. And I've just spoken about Sabbath, about resting. Then fuel or the fuel tank, that is prayer. You cannot move on in life. A car cannot shift without fuel in it. When I was coming, we first we stopped at a fuel station, put in. When you are moving in life, you must have prayer. Hallelujah. Are you people prayerful? Mm. 
Provost, I'm not sure about some of your people. So prayer. Then the tires is the word of God or the study of, of the Bible because it moves you from one place to the next. And then lastly, fasting is the jeers. That's what the Holy Spirit put in me. So that's the wholeness of our move with God using a, an item that we are all familiar with. So now let's get into um, fasting itself. The jeers of life, the jeers. Um, so we are going to engage jeers. Tell your neighbor, engage your jeers now. Begin now. Okay, all right. And the first one, you know, cars have many jeers as we shall see. So the first jeer that you need in fasting, the first one is to be disciplined in your eating. If you are a glutton, hmm, you know a glutton? A glutton is a person who eats beyond what they have to eat or what they need to eat. That is gluttony. If you are beyond the normal eating, it is sin. And indeed, you know, one of the sins of of uh, Sodom. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah? It was gluttony. The prophet Ezekiel writes in, uh, or notes in um, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, that the fullness of bread, the fullness of bread was one of the sins of, um, of these, these people. Let's read it. Let's read it. It's, it's, on, it's on screen. One, two, three. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So the fullness of food, gluttony. If you cannot, you will not be able to fast. And so that is the first jeer that you need to tame your love for food. If that is untamed, then brother, sister, fasting is not for you. Let's engage second year. The second year is we can begin off by fasting a few hours. By the way, I'm not taking you away from your 40 days. We have to do the 40 days. But I'm just trying to emphasize a discipline that you can pass on to other people or to use in other seasons. So fasting for a few hours uh, I would call Gia number two. Then Gia number three, uh, you can do a three-day fast. A three-day fast, you are now beginning to move. You are beginning to move. That is Gia number three. Gia number four is, can be a seven-day fast. I'm not saying is, can be, because this is, these are not hard and fast rules. So number, seven-day fast is a good one. Um, as we keep growing this discipline of uh, fasting. Gia number five is a 40-day fast. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I am on Gia number five. You're on Gia number five. Yes, 40 days. Number six, a 100-day fast. Say Hallelujah. Now you are really cruising. You are really, really going. Then number seven, 300 day fast. Now let me say something about this. I know of groups who have done 100 day fast, 200 day fast. However, however, let me emphasize this point, please. Huh? These ones, by the way, are for illustrative purposes. I'm not recommending. I'm using for illustration to help us to understand this whole thing. Um, the critical point I'm, I'm making here is that one, fasting, let's understand that fasting is not a sign of um, greater spirituality. No. It is not a sign of greater sp spirituality. Do not think that because you fast you are better than the other person. 
And for that matter, fasting for a long time, huh? 40 days, 70 days, 100 days, 200 days, doesn't make you, doesn't make me superior to anyone. Hallelujah. Please, let's be careful. Why? If we start to think that because I can fast 40 days, because I can do 70 days, because on the 100 I've added on uh, 70, then I am, hmm? I have arrived. Huh? That's what we used to say. I have arrived. Be careful lest you fall. Paul warns us in First Corinthians, I think it's chapter 10, verse 12. Be careful if you believe you are standing. So it is not a sign of spiritual spirit, uh, superiority. It is just a discipline that helps you to get to know God more or better or deeper. But doing a hundred days and the one who has done three days, the one who has done three days may benefit much more than you who has done a hundred days. Hallelujah. So let's be careful. So similarly, in vehicles, by the way, I think most cars, uh, I know I've used gears that people do not. These days, people drive automatic gears. Huh? Uh, they don't know one, two, three engaging. Um, I've seen Captain Tony there. I think you, you and I know how to engage these ones. Huh? Yeah, for me, I like those ones, but I can't find them anymore. After, when I sold my last car that had this, and I was looking for the next, I looked for autom um, manual gears. I failed to find them. But you see, the thing about manual gears is, you know, m when you move from one to two to three, you know, you feel like you are driving. <laughs> ah, as I miss. If anyone knows a not too expensive um, manual gear car, please uh, get, get my contact. So most cars have one to five, even the automatic ones, I think huh? six, six now. So most, uh, even, even the automatic ones, it's just that you are not the one who engages them. They do so automatically. There are those that go seven and eight. For instance, rally cars. Rally cars, I think, have seven or so, six or seven. And then Formula One cars have eight. So the point I've been making that the, you don't have to do 100 days, you don't have to do 70 days to feel, I mean, that doesn't make you any better. For me, it's the same thing. I do not, I would not want to drive a rally car. I'm happy with my car, simple car. Hallelujah. Because it gets me from place to place. It is sufficient for me. So I don't have to reach gear number eight. I don't have to drive like a Formula One uh, uh, driver. You know, Lewis Hamilton. I don't have to be a Lewis Hamilton. Hallelujah. I don't have to be Schumacher. I can be the simple... Uh, we had a driver in, in, in Budo called Mafta. I can be like Mafta. No problem. He used to drive that lorry and the dust would be hitting us. But we're happy, happy because we're coming from wherever, football or, or socials or whatever. So it is okay. You don't have to reach gear number eight. You don't have to drive like a Formula One driver. Hallelujah. As long as you know what you are doing, as long as it gets you from one place to the next. Amen. And so as we develop spiritual disciplines, it is important that you keep on the road. Do not leave the road. Do not get into reverse. Do not begin to backslide on any, whether it is fasting or any of the, the other disciplines. What is backsliding? Or what are the effects of backsliding? Prayer and fasting becomes a burden. Prayer and fasting, when, when prayer and fasting becomes a burden, just know you are now on the way to backsliding. When reading scripture has become a burden, you know you are in trouble or backsliding. When you I cannot witness anymore. The other day I was with um, Sister Joy and she was telling me how she witnesses in, you know, when she's in public transport. She, she says, hallelujah, God bless you. Increase the anointing on you. 
Don't get tired. Amen? She will not. I know she won't get. When worship, your worship life has become dull, when backsliding, you know, you know but the, when you backslide, it kills other people, potential believers. Whether actually those who already believe or those who would potentially believe. Just imagine in your own family. Okay? We, have, we all have brothers and sisters, parents and so on, cousins. And I believe you're probably praying for, for their uh, salvation. Now, they've seen you all these years. They may not yet be saved, but now if you backslide... So, so they probably admire, now if you backslide, they will lose hope. You could actually cost someone's soul because you've backslidden. So now, I, I just found it wonderful that this church would begin the year in fasting. That is great. You are dedicating the entire year. You are dedicating your personal life. You are dedicating the, the church life. You know, it's a, it's a great thing. Let that not ever stop in this church. Say with me, amen, if you believe that. Let it never, ever stop. Or even if you move from this church, you go to another one, why not begin your year with a fast? It's such a powerful foundation for your year. So let's not backslide from it. Let's keep going. So, we are not going to engage reverse gear. Let me give a, a brief testimony as I begin to wind up. In the year 2014, I had this dream. I think I've shared it here before. Some of you may have heard it. But anyway, I, have, I get this dream in which I'm in a car. My wife and I are in a car. And the car was a Volkswagen Kombi. Now, I grew up, my father used to drive Volkswagen Kombis. Uh, this was our church when I was a young man, and we used to park somewhere. Anyway, the, the geography has changed a little bit. But the point is, where in this combi, I was seated in the middle. My wife was in the last passenger seat. The, the combi, the, the, the roof of the car was sheared off, and then here was the driver's seat. Now, the driver's seat was empty. And then the car started reversing. It reversed, and it was night. It reversed all night on all the hills of Kampala. Reverse, reverse. I don't know how many hills there are now. There used to be seven. There are now probably 70. Reversed all night long. And then, remember which driver? There was no driver. And the car was? reversing. Then at exactly 6 a.m., boom, it stops at Central Police Station. Eh? Now what does police station arrest? And I come out of the car. When I come out, I'm wearing, I don't know whether it's a long shirt or a short kanzu. Whichever of the two, hmm? but up to here. But underneath, no trousers, no underpants. And here I am under arrest. That thing frightened me so much. (laughs) So I resolved to go before the Lord to find out, Lord, what are you saying? What is this? What are you saying in this dream? Reversing all night long. Park at the CPS and you are half naked. Eh? All the prophetic symbols in there were quite frightening. But God in his grace, friends, do not, never ever ignore a dream or dreams. Because God speaks through them. So when I inquired of him, I just found out that there are things in my life that were not right. I mean, I was busy ministering. I don't know whether I ministered here in that season. I was leading fellowship and so on. But there were things that I needed to set right in my life. So he was telling me that the driver of my life is not in the seat of my car. That I was in reverse. And so, in fact, yes, I went, yes, yes. Speaking of solitude, I took seven days off. Solitude. I went away. No telephone, no nothing. No family people, nothing. 
And it is, within, it is in that time of solitude that he revealed to me. I got the revelation that there are certain things I need to set right. And I set them right. Amen. Hallelujah. And by the end of that season, I got a commissioning um, to do some of the work I'm doing now. But it took one, um, listening, and then two, inquiring of him, and then three, you know, repenting and setting things right. So, be careful, do not engage reverse yourself, okay? Or if you find yourself in reverse, find out why it is you are in, a re in reverse. Let's begin to wind up. We are looking at fasting as a spiritual discipline. Now, the gravity, the gravity of the spiritual challenge will, dis will um, dictate the type and the length of the fast that you are to do. There are some which are corporate fasts, like what you are doing here right now is a corporate fast, and we shall shortly look at the blessings of um, corporate fasts. But there are fasts that are called by God himself. For instance, the one we are reading about in, in, in Joel chapter 2. But then there will be those where you get the conviction in your spirit that I, I need to fast. Once that conviction comes, do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. There was, a, there was a Christmas a few years ago where we fasted. Fasting on Christmas? Hey, we did. <laughs> not an easy one, but we didn't die. And we ate other Christmases. And so there will be that conviction that comes that... It's time for a fast now. Um, Provost, please don't declare fast this Christmas for your people. Let them. So, what does fasting, what is fasting? It is atomic power with God. It heightens our spiritual state. When we fast, we manifest an extra power. I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, that by the end of the 40 days, you will have a certain power that maybe you did not have on the, first, on the 31st of December. Um, it, um, quick examples of, of power. When Paul was struck, you remember on the way to Damascus, the first thing that Paul did, um, of course he asked God to forgive him and so on. Then he, w he immediately went into a fast. I don't know how many of us have fasted on the day that we have become saved, we have converted to Christ. Anyone here who fasted straight away? You see why we are missing Paul's? Just think of that power that came upon this gentleman. Little wonder he was the effective um, servant of God that he was. The power that came out, um, out of him because of that fast. Of course, Jesus himself, the Lord himself, fasted at the beginning of his ministry. And so, that gave him the power to go on. Moses, before he receives the Ten Commandments, Esther and her maids, all, you know, it's power that comes out of this thing. Um, a fantastic example of wonderful things being done, where I remember King Jehoshaphat, when he heard that the Ammonites and the uh, Moabites were coming, he was really, he didn't know what to do. But the Spirit of the Lord led him to declare a fast in the entire country. And that is what helped them. So, a corporate fast is a powerful thing. There is a lot of power that comes out of it. God uses collective fasting or united fasting to change the tide of history. As we can see with Judah, in that case, as we can see with Paul. I call Paul the greatest Christian there has been. We can see that the, 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 the Jews who were in, um, in, that, prov in uh, that empire, they survived. Why did they survive? Because of that fast, that the power that came out of the fast um, that Esther declared. So, he, he uses it. God uses that collective uh, fast to change the tide of history. I am confident 
brethren, that God is going to change something in All Saints Cathedral. I am confident that God is going to change something in individuals' lives, the people who are participating, who are a part of this fast. Hallelujah. Do you guys believe it? I mean, I believe it. So if you guys don't believe it, I believe it. Why? Because the evidence is there. It is biblical evidence that collective fasts, God just changes things. In corporate fasts, he changes things. So for your organization, your company, if you want things to change, if you've been in the red, okay, for the last three, four years, you are not turning a profit, call a fast. Call a collective fast in your organization, in your institution. Call it. You see things change. If people come, we come into it with all their hearts. They are called solemn assemblies, not because people are solemn like this, but it's because they are focused on God. And so you need to have fire, passion, and life in this thing. And so for me, um, Reverend Hillary sent me the entire um, lineup of uh, a program of this 40 day. I was impressed that every single day on two or three, two, three times a day, there is prayer. Hallelujah. That is it. That, that, it has to be accompanied by that kind of fire. And then it will have real, real um, impact. Amen. Let's look at um, benefits of a corporate fast as I conclude. Um, these are some of the benefits of a corporate fast is that it heightens sensitivity to the spirit. I want to think, I, I hope I'll, I'll be able to come back here. Kindly invite me to, just to attend on, after the 40 days. I would like to hear the testimonies. It increases unity. You'll, you'll be seeing that. Then there's potential. You know, people sit in the pews whose gifts we do not know, but I believe they'll be uncovered. Then the prioritization of prayer, as we've seen. And I want to think that beyond even the corporate prayer, there is other uh, prayer. And then it broadens reach. How does it broaden reach? Because the Holy Spirit... Um, uh, uncovers or brings forth new things that you may, they may not have been part of the beginning, but, you know, then you realize that, okay, let's tackle this, let's focus on that, let's do this one. So those are some of the benefits. i just naming five. Um, let me conclude with the spiritual. Now, life begins in the spiritual. Whether it is all... Life on earth, remember in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, before the creation, the Spirit of the Lord was hovering up to the end. You know, Revelation 22, 21, life begins the spiritual. Yourself, the Lord tells us in Jeremiah chapter 1 that I knew you even before I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you. I knew you. How did he know us? We are not physical beings. We are spiritual beings. So your life has begun in the spiritual before it becomes physical in your mother's womb. It is there in the spiritual. When your body dies, your spirit does not die. Hallelujah. So life begins in the spiritual. It ends in the spiritual. So how can you not leave it in the spiritual? When the real thing is on, how can you not leave it in the spiritual? So, it is, if we recognize that life begins in the spiritual, ends in the spiritual, then we had better spiritualize it on a day-to-day -day basis. Which is why we must adapt these 12, or not, they're not only 12, they are more, these spiritual disciplines. It's what will help us to live a spiritual life. Amen? Because our life 
begins in the spiritual. God said, I knew you even before I formed you. It means somewhere there, in a cupboard, in a fridge, wherever, your spiritual, the aspects of your spiritual life are there. They are just waiting to be retrieved and activated in life. They are waiting to be retrieved. So you are a key player in this. You have to avail yourself then God will, will activate them. But if you do not avail yourself, why, why should he bother? There are so many other people whom he can work on. And so let us take these, um, our response, our personal response is, is important. Let us take the spiritual disciplines uh, as um, understand them to be critical and apply them in our lives. Thank you very much and God bless you.